Bismillah, you're listening to the Muslim Conversation, a radio program by Danish Muslims in mainstream Danish radio. My name is Elias Ramadan, and I'll be going one-on-one with none other than Dr. Azam Tamimi, who is a doctor of political theory, world-renowned Muslim thinker, and known for having authored many articles and books on Islam, secularism, democracy, and more. Dr. Azam, assalamu alaikum, alaikum and welcome to the program. Thank you. You're a quite relevant figure for uh, to follow these days, um, and we're very delighted to have you with us today. Let's go right into it, shall we? Thank you very much. Dr. Tamimi, when you look around the world with a bird eye view, how would you describe how these events happening in Gaza right now are changing world dynamics as we know them? Well, uh, I I think what's going on in Gaza is um, uh, unprecedented in every uh, term. Uh, It is very painful, definitely for us, more painful for the people of Gaza themselves. Uh, But it is certainly changing the world, and we can uh, clearly see the impact of this Israeli uh, 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 offensive uh, on world public opinion. Um, Until uh, recently, uh, this uh, issue, the issue of Palestine, was taken for granted. I mean, yes, there is a conflict, but one day there will be peace, there will be two-state solution, and it will be over. But I think now the world realizes that uh, the issue is a lot more complex than this. It is actually very much similar to what South Africa suffered from uh, for decades, uh, an apartheid sort of uh, regime uh, that is almost impossible to coexist with. As a doctor of political theory, uh, I wanted to ask you, when I was younger and followed the Iraq war, I heard several times Al-Harbu Furqan. Translated, war is a decisive separator. As a doctor of political theory, how would you elaborate on this phrase, especially reflecting on what's happening in Gaza right now? Well, war is uh, is not a good thing. I mean, we'd rather not have wars. But why do we have wars in the first place? Why do we have conflicts in the first place? Because there is a segment of uh, human society uh, that is uh, aggressive, uh, that is... uh, Uh, seeking to dominate others, um, for instance, colonialism in the history, in the in the modern history. Mm. Colonialism is the cause of so much suffering around the world. And when you invade uh, a, a certain people's country, uh, when you dispossess them, when you dehumanize them, it is only natural that they react, they resist. It's called resistance. Mm. And uh, this is what's happening in Palestine. Uh, The world didn't want to recognize the resistance of the Palestinian people because there has been so much propaganda, so much uh, distortion of uh, the reality of this conflict. This is not a communal conflict. This is not a conflict between two neighbors that had been living uh, peacefully together and suddenly they started having uh, a dispute over uh, who has what. No, far from it. Uh, Palestine was subjected to a foreign invasion. Uh, I, I, I call it a European colonial invasion uh, aimed at two things. On the one hand, to solve uh, a European a Jewish problem. Uh, Jews never had a problem with the Arabs or the, or the Muslims. They lived with the Arabs and the Muslims for many centuries uh, in uh, peace and harmony. It was Europe that had a problem with its Jews. It was anti-Semitic, or there was anti-Semitism in Europe. There were pogroms in Russia. There was a Dreyfus affair in uh, France. And then there was the Holocaust. And it seemed that Europe didn't know how to coexist with its Jewish communities. And they wanted to send them somewhere else. In addition, of course, to the rise of Christian Zionism, an ideology that believes the Messiah would not come until all the Jews were sent back to the uh, promised land. So the people of Palestine, out of uh, the blue, found themselves in confrontation with the Western world who wanted to dump uh, the Jews that they didn't want in Europe uh, on Palestinian uh, land. And that's why the Palestinians have been struggling. Mm. I just wanted to touch upon what you said about um, Palestinian resistance. Isn't there a limit as to how far one can go in resistance? 
Well, resistance is usually a reaction. It's a reaction to an action. So it depends on what sort of action you exact upon your victims. Mm. Uh, never in the history of humanity was there liberation without uh, resistance. It's impossible. Look at Vietnam. I mean, would the Vietnamese have been uh, freed of uh, uh, American uh, colonialism had they not uh, put up resistance? Mm. Uh, look at the Algerians. France colonized Algeria for 130 But years. Isn't there any limits as to what legitimate resistance can look like? I guess I'm asking when is when does uh, resistance become? Do you mean the, the means and the, the tools? The means and the tools of resistance. As I explained to you, the means and the tools are a reaction to the means and the tools used by the aggressor. So if the, if the aggressor is using force, and uh, nice talking isn't uh, 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 doing anything, it's not liberating the land, it's not restoring your dignity and humanity. Hmm. You have to fight for it definitely. In South Africa, for instance, many people forgot that the South African people had also armed resistance. And it was armed resistance in addition to uh, the global uh, uh, struggle for freedom in South Africa that brought about the end of apartheid. And uh, why should the Palestinians uh, be denied the right uh, to resist like uh, all other uh, victims of colonialism? Uh, were able to resist, even in uh, Nazi uh, uh, Germany. But you also had people from the ANC in South Africa who were convicted. But this, it's not the case in uh, in this situation happening right now in Gaza. Who were what? Who were convicted. Convicted? Of, of terrorism and attacks and so on. It doesn't matter. You see, it doesn't matter what the colonial powers do. I mean, for, take for instance today. Uh, some Palestinian factions, including Hamas, are designated as terrorists. It doesn't really matter what the Americans say or what the Israelis say or what the British say. Uh, what matters is how the Palestinians see this resistance. The Palestinians today, the overwhelming majority of the Palestinians today, consider their resistance legitimate and consider it to be the only avenue available to them uh, in order to liberate their land and be free themselves. When you say it doesn't matter, do you mean it doesn't matter for Palestinians or do- who doesn't it matter for? It doesn't matter for the truth. Nelson Mandela was once called a terrorist by Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher vowed that Nelson Mandela would never be allowed to set foot on British soil. And eventually when apartheid was defeated and uh, Nelson Mandela was elected the uh, uh, president of South Africa, he arrived in the uh, in Britain and was given a, a hero's welcome uh, because he was recognized for what he is, a hero. People who resist colonialism, people who resist oppression are not terrorists in the eyes of the victims. They are heroes. Gaza has been besieged several times before. It's not the first time uh, what we're seeing right now. Uh, proportions can be discussed, but... Uh, A siege of Gaza has happened before in 2009 and 14 and you, more than you that. You mean an attack on Gaza, but the siege has been going on non-stop since 2006. Hmm. Uh, I guess you can call it that. Um, but why is this time so different? What makes it dif- different? The difference this time is that the initiative was taken by the victims of oppression. Every time the Israelis were the ones who started the attack, Um, the Israelis, um, in most cases, call them preemptive attacks. Even when there was a truce, and there were several instances, which I describe in my book, uh, Hamas uh, Unwritten Chapters, there were several instances of a truce between Israel and Hamas. It was Israel that violated the truce. This time, on the 7th of October, Israel was taken by surprise. The entire world was taken by surprise. The victims, for a change, decided to initiate the attack, to initiate the offensive. And they did, and they shook the entire world hmm. that despite the siege that has been going on for 17 years, despite the in- inability in the eyes of the world uh, to even speak uh, the truth to the world, they managed to uh, carry out an attack that uh, exposed the vulnerability Uh, the weakness uh, of the Israeli state to the extent that Netanyahu went crying to Biden and his and other allies uh, in Europe uh, asking for immediate intervention. Mm. It uh, sounds to me as you criticize when when Israel uh, breaks the truce 
but this time it was Hamas. Wasn't it as wrong this time by Hamas as it usually is when Israel does it? No, there was no truce. Israel has been uh, attacking Gaza at will whenever it uh, it saw fit. Uh, Israel in the West Bank has been desecrating Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the holiest place, the third holiest place for for the Muslims in the world. Israel has been. Uh, letting the settlers loose on uh, Palestinian farmers, burning their crops and uh, chopping off their trees and uh, attacking them, harassing them. Israel has been uh, causing so much pain to the uh, Palestinians. Israel has been occupying the West Bank for 57 years. And uh, therefore, the Palestinians have been on the receiving end of Israeli blows. This time they decided to... Uh, themselves uh, uh, hit Israel back. Let me ask a bit more simple question. I think for for uh, many people, when I look online, they are just asking for for peace. Um, and as a historian, many times I, I I think I'm a bit too critical, and I think it's just something naive, and I ignore it. But you seem to me as someone who's more of a positive thinker. How what, what's your thought on on such callings? No, peace is something that we all aspire to see, but you cannot have peace without justice. It's impossible. Any any peace that is achieved without justice is simply just a subjugation of the others, the enslavement of the others, forcing them to uh, be quiet without uh, being dignified. And uh, Hamas, uh, as I explained in the book again, offered the Israelis several times what it called hudna or long-term truce hmm. because they want peace. They want to see an end to the bloodshed uh, on both sides. The Israelis don't treat the Palestinians as equals. They don't see them as equal human beings. Even the defense minister in Israel recently called them animals. Hmm. Uh, it, it is very reminiscent of the apartheid of South Africa where the whites did not see the blacks uh, as equal human beings. and. Uh, just uh, dispossessed them and in uh, uh, held them in uh, huge cages called townships, uh, made use of them as a labor force without giving them any rights. If we look back at 2009 or sorry, late 2008, Israel claimed that Hamas broke the truce by killing some of its sh- uh, soldiers. No, no. Before the operation cast led. That's, that's, that's totally wrong. There was a truce that lasted for about six months hmm. And it was violated when Israel attacked a number of Hamas operatives in the south of Gaza. This is how how, how it was violated. There was even a truce much earlier during the uh, premiership of uh, Shimon Peres, uh, when also the truce lasted for about six months and Shimon Peres, for, ele- for election purposes, mm. decided to assassinate Yahya Ayash, a leading figure in uh, in Hamas. Every time it was Israel that violated a truce. And by the way, those truces were not official. They were unofficial truces mediated through third party. Israel did not see Hamas or the Palestinians as equally dignified people to deal with them directly. Even the prisoner exchange, they always went through the Egyptians or went through some third party because mm. they just looked down upon the Palestinians. Some might view what's happening right now in Gaza Uh, referring to the paralysis of the Arab and Muslim world uh, as a failure of political Islamist movements in the other half of the 20th century. How do you view it? I don't see that there has been a failure. I think uh, the uh, Islamic movements have been struggling in order to create um, uh, 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 an acceptable uh, level of awareness among the masses after decades of oppression, of persecution by dictatorships across uh, the region, from the Atlantic uh, Ocean all the way to the uh, Gulf, to the Arabian Gulf, or as it is called in the West, the Persian uh, Gulf. Mm. And that's why we had, as a fruit of this, of these efforts, the Arab Spring in 2011. Yet, uh, the dictatorships in the Gulf in, uh, collaborated with Israel and with the superpowers in the West in order to crush the Arab Spring and end uh, uh, the march of democratization. Could you be more specific? Which uh, dictatorships are you referring to? Well, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were horrified to see Egypt become a democratic country, 
horrified to see the to to see the prospect of Libya, Syria, Yemen, uh, 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 Tunisia becoming uh, democratic uh, on the medium to long uh, term. So they paid billions of dollars in order to bring down the elected president of Egypt, Dr. Mohamed Morsi, and they collaborated with the Israelis. And this is well documented because both dictatorships in the region, Arab dictatorships in the region and Israel do not want to see democratization anywhere because once the people are free and once the people can elect their own uh, uh, politicians and make those politicians accountable to them, uh, Uh, Israel knows that the normalization uh, process would not work because most of the people don't want to normalize with an entity that is occupying uh, the land of the Palestinians, which is actually Arab and Muslim land. Yeah, and I think you can mention Qatar as well, the blockade in Qatar, and you can mention the election of uh, President Morsi and so on. But still, how do you explain the paralysis? Like Even the ones who are allied to the Muslim Brotherhood, you can mention, as I just mentioned, Qatar and others, they're paralyzed. It's not like they are intervening in any way. Well, uh, the defeat of the Arab Spring has had its impact on the countries that initially sympathized with the peoples of the region in their quest uh, for democratization. Turkey and Qatar did side with the masses in the region. But the Arab Spring has been suffocated, has been killed, actually. It has been assassinated. And uh, the world saw how Saudi Arabia, together with the United Arab Emirates and with the consent of the Egyptians and the Bahrainis, imposed a siege uh, around Qatar. And had it not been for um, Turkish intervention and the refusal of the Americans to allow an invasion of, uh, uh, of Qatar by the Saudis, uh, probably we, we would not have Qatar today because the Saudis were intent on invading Qatar. Mm. But today, uh, both countries, Qatar and Turkey, uh, as states have to deal with the reality. And the reality is that uh, the Arab Spring has has collapsed or has, has been uh, torpedoed. Mm. Of course, uh, especially Turkey, uh, Palestinians, and the Turkish people were expecting more from the Turkish government. I think the response of the Turkish government was quite uh, belated. Uh, Turkey has full diplomatic and economic relations with Israel, and they should, from day number one, use at least a threat to sever those ties if Israel did not uh, end uh, the uh, the attack and the, the the genocide that it is perpetrating uh, uh, in uh, inside the Gaza but it took them a while it took so much pressure from the public in Turkey for the Turkish government uh, to uh, to make a move and th- that is indeed regrettable but i can understand that uh, Turkey and Qatar are not free to do even what they'd love to do because of the geopolitics in the region Dr. Azam, have a sip of water. Bismillah. Um, meanwhile, I'll ask you, going back to the question about the failure of Islamism, uh, if one can say so. And well, I, I haven't accepted that there was a failure. Accepted. All right, <laughs> let me just try and challenge it uh, for a bit. Another in uh, Tunisia, they were very popular after the Arab Spring and their popul- popularity fell. And that was as a result of democracy. And that could be interpreted as a failure of Islamism. No, you see, what happened in Tunisia is what happened in Egypt. It was an attack on democratization. Uh, it's bigger even than Islamism or the Islamic movements. The Islamic movements did not create the Arab Spring. They, they, they did not initiate the Arab Spring. They were actually uh, introduced by the masses to lead the process of change. Mm. But then the opponents of this change, when they rallied together and uh, combined their resources and efforts to torpedo uh, the dynamic, uh, naturally the Islamic movements that were leading that dynamic uh, were the primary targets. But actually, more generally speaking, the target is democratization. Democracy is a threat. Democracy in the Arab world is a threat to Israel as well as to dictatorships in the region. And that's why We've seen the Abraham Accords. We've seen uh, Saudi attempts to normalize relations with uh, Israel. Uh, We've seen the collusion of the Egyptian government currently with Israel uh, because they see themselves in one camp against the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab masses who are 
in, in another camp. So it's not about Islamism or the failure of Islamism. The Islamic movements have uh, suffered the brunt of uh, the onslaught on democratization, but, but they haven't failed. It was through election after election. First time, I remember they had more than 80 seats or so in parliament, al Nahda in uh, Tunisia. And then their popularity fell over the two second elections. No, it wasn't that their popularity fell. They, did, they decided to withdraw. They saw what happened in Egypt and they were advised by so many people inside in the region as well as outside the region that you have to take it easy. If you uh, go for power through the ballot box and if you win, the same thing will happen to you as happened to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So then the Nahda in Tunisia thought they could avert the same fate that was met by the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. But no. Uh, those who are opposed to democratization were intent on torpedoing, uh, torpedoing all, uh, also the, uh, the the experiment in Tunisia. The uh, Sunni Muslim world is not the only part of the world that uh, lived through uh, Islamization through the other half of the 19th century. We have Iran as well. Uh, you have in Lebanon, Hezbollah, in Syria, uh, the Iran supported Houthis in Yemen and so on. They're actually doing something right now. They're intervening militarily as well. Um, is there something that these this understanding of Islamization that was done properly, where Sunni Muslim Islamization was done wrong? You see, putting all these uh, events under the umbrella of Islamism is, I think, a misreading of what's going on. What's uh, what's going on is part of a struggle, a century-long struggle for freedom and independence in this part of the world. Because this part of the world, after the, 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 the fall of the Ottoman Empire, uh, following the defeat of the, uh, of the Ottomans in the First World, First world War, that the region fell to colonial uh, influence. The British and the French in particular divided the region between them. And they created new modern states. Uh, Uh, tail, uh, designed or tailored in the shape of the European nation state, but they actually they were they were they were not actually nation states. I mm -hmm. call them territorial states. These states uh, are designed in a manner that uh, they do, they are not democratic. They don't respect human rights. Their uh, uh, linked their interests their their uh, self interests are connected to the interests of the former colonial powers, and therefore. They're acting against the people they are ruling. Rather than serve the people, they're actually acting against the people. And then when the Iranian revolution happened in 1979 against the Shah of Iran, mm. who was uh, the, considered by the Americans their policeman in the region, turmoil started because Saudi Arabia and some of its allies together with the Europeans and the Americans were horrified at this change. Mm. They didn't want the rest of the region to aspire to uh, for similar changes uh, because uh, that revolution was supported across the region by everybody, Sunnis and Shiites uh, alike. They uh, uh, incited uh, Saddam Hussein to wage a war against Iran and that deepened the division between the Shiites and the Sunnis. So it's really very complicated. At every stage, uh, uh, there was this uh, consolidation of the camps of the different axes in the region. And uh, Iran eventually found itself in an axis by itself uh, with hostility from uh, the allies of the United States of America in the region. Uh, and that's why when America invaded uh, uh, Iraq, uh, the Iranians were happy to see Saddam Hussein go, go away. The Americans were stupid enough to join hands with the allies of Iran in order to make the change in Iraq. And eventually, Iraq ended up in the hands of the Iranians. So it's, it, it's not necessarily something that the Iranians did, but in most cases, it is something that the uh, uh, opponents of Iran were doing wrong in the region, mm -hmm. including Saudi Arabia. You mentioned the Houthis, for instance. What brought the Houthis in power in Yemen? What handed Yemen uh, uh, to them uh, on, on a silver plate? It was the Saudis and the Emiratis because at the al Yemeni al-Islah, the Islah party in Yemen was Sunni and connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Saudis and the Emiratis 
didn't want the Islah to become the next democratically elected government in Yemen as the Muslim Brotherhood became the elected government of Egypt. Mm. So they joined hands with Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president of, uh, uh, of Yemen, uh, in order to bring the Houthis in as a tool. They used the Houthis as a tool in order to attack the Sunni movement, the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Houthis were cleverer than the Saudis and the Emiratis. They joined hand with the Iranians and Yemen ended up being within the sphere of Iran. So it's, it's really a much more complex uh, picture than uh, hmm. uh, simply seeing it through the prism of Islamism. Then could you explain the capability of the Shia Muslim world to act and the paralysis in contrast of the paralysis of the Sunni Muslim world? Again, this question is based on on uh, on a faulty premise, in my opinion. It's not a question of paralysis. It's a question of a continuous interaction and interplay between different axes in the region. I think what we need to do, what we need to see, not do, but what we need is to see in the future is a new axes for freedom and dignity in the region, irrespective of religion, irrespective of Sect- sectarian um, uh, affiliation. This region is denied freedom. That's the most important thing. That's the most important issue. And uh, uh, if, if we focus on this, all these other minor uh, divisions diminish and become insignificant. In Denmark, we got to witness the efficiency of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation that consists of 57 Muslim countries when they got together to pressure Denmark and Sweden to formulate laws that ban Qur'an burnings in front of embassies. How do we explain the OIC's lacking efficiency when it comes to the siege and mass killing of Palestinian civilians in Gaza? OIC is a club of governments, a club of, uh, club of states, most of which are undemocratic. They are not elected. They are not subject to um, accountability by the people they are uh, ruling. Uh, And this reflects on what the OIC can or cannot do. Uh, Any member of the OIC, especially the founding members, can veto any motion. So even if uh, a country like Turkey or a country like uh, Qatar would come up with a motion to do something uh, more practical, to end the butchery of the people of Gaza. Saudi Arabia can veto it, Egypt can veto it, many other countries can veto it. So actually, yes, they can uh, come up with the motions they agree on where it doesn't cost them anything, uh, like uh, bringing pressure to bear on uh, Scandinavia regarding the issue of burning the Mus'haf. Mm. But uh, when it comes to Palestine, many of the members of the OIC collude with Israel in the current genocide. They want Israel to finish Hamas and uh, get rid of uh, the headache that Hamas keeps causing to them. Hmm. Saudi Arabia has uh, uh, on the record been saying this, the Egyptians have been saying this, many others have been, been saying this. So uh, the Palestinians have learned not to expect much from the Arab League or from the OIC, just as they don't expect much from the United Nations. Most Muslims, Arabs, and, and quite frankly also pro-Palestine supporters in general, they view normalizing relationships with uh, Israel as betrayal. How do you view it? Of course, definitely it is betrayal. How can you normalize a relationship with an entity that was created on the land stolen from the Palestinians, a land whose people were di- dispossessed, thrown out, and have been rotting in refugee camps for 75 years? The least they could have done is get something out of Israel in exchange for normalization. They got nothing for the Palestinians. Uh, The other problem, of course, is normalizing relationship with an ideology that is racist. My problem with with, uh, Israel is not with the Jews. Uh, We've never had a problem with the Jews in that part of the world before Israel was created. We call them Ahlul Kitab, people of the book. We call them Ahlul Dhimma. They have a covenant. We mm. are, we Muslims, are bound by a covenant mm. uh, in dealing with the Christians and the Jews, who are the people of the book. We share with them one uh, uh, original source of uh, revelation or guidance. Mm. The, the problem started when Zionism uh, uh, became a project, a project that entered into an alliance with Western colonial, uh, Western colonial powers and ended up in occupying Palestine 
and dispossessing its people. Zionism is a problem because it's racist. Many people do not realize that Zionism considers the Jews to be superhuman, whereas the non-Jews in Palestine are subhuman. Um, it's so racist that uh, uh, you cannot actually deal with it in, is in just the same way as the blacks of South Africa couldn't deal with apartheid. Sorry, doctor, we will get back to the Zionism part, but uh, sticking to the question about normalization, an argument is made that in order to pressure Israel whenever conflict escalates, you need to have leverage. How can you have leverage when you don't deal with Israel? Well, you can have leverage by saying to Israel that we will not deal with you until you end occupation rather than deal with it, go to bed with it while occupation is continuing. I mean, look at the, the Emiratis and the Bahrainis. Hmm. They claimed that they were doing this for the sake of the Palestinians, but actually they are now supporting Israel in its genocide in Gaza. A famous and somewhat controversial commentator these days, Shahid Bolson, has been arguing for normalization in the Middle East but not by other Muslim countries. Let's see what he had to say and uh, hear what your thoughts on it is. So BDS makes sense in the West. Boycott and divestment makes sense uh, for the countries that are key to Israel's economy. That makes perfect sense. Exploiting uh, Israel's economic dependence on the West is just one measure, but, but uh, the strategic and the logical complementary measure is actually normalization, transferring economic dependence to the Arab world. I mean, who says that if the Muslim world normalizes with Israel, that they can't then, uh, at a later date, rescind that normalization once they have actually grown some kind of uh, influence in their economy? If you don't already have relations, then there's nothing that you can threaten to suspend. These are complementary measures, in my opinion. And if, if you think about it strategically, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. Think about it strategically instead of ideologically. How do you respond to that? I think he is misinformed about the nature of the conflict. Not only that, those who are normalizing relations with Israel are doing it for their own self-interest, not for the sake of the Palestinians or even for the sake of their peoples. I mean, look at the UAE. The UAE is imprisoning uh, scholars, lawyers, activists, mm. uh, not allowing people even to tweet something uh, without uh, a, a risk of uh, going uh, to prison. And uh, they are uh, normalizing relations with Israel uh, for the sake of the, for the benefit of the ruling elite, not for the for the benefit of uh, uh, of the people. Uh, uh, again, that's why I was talking about Zionism. You see, you are normalizing with a racist regime, with an ideology that does not see the other as equal human beings. Uh, whoever is calling for normalization with Israel is similar to those who were supporting apartheid in South Africa. Mm. No difference whatsoever. And that's why in the case of South Africa, uh, there was a, a global movement was uh, forming and was growing in order to uh, uh, boycott the South African regime. And that really bore fruits uh, in the end and apartheid came to, came to an end. Mm. So in order to pressure Israel to end Zionism, and allow a peaceful coexistence between the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews in that part of the world, you need to boycott Israel rather than normalize the relations with it. You said before that uh, you should, or Muslim countries should uh, threaten Israel uh, by not uh, dealing with it. But is that leverage? I mean, if, if you don't have anything before the conflict starts or escalates, do you have any kind of leverage? They're not dependent, as Bolson said, they're not dependent on the Muslim world, they're dependent on the Western world. And as long as they are that, they don't, the, the, the threats of not dealing with them, are they efficient in any way? See, the Israelis uh, pride themselves with the inroads they opened into uh, the Muslim world and third world countries in particular. Before uh, Sadat uh, uh, concluded his Camp David agreement with Israel and before Yasser Arafat concluded his Oslo agreement with mm. Uh, with the Israelis. The Israelis had uh, very few relations with what we call the third world countries or countries in much of Africa, uh, Asia and uh, Latin America. Soon after that, the world opened to them and uh, they started exporting billions. Uh, uh, they started uh, exporting technology and equipment and weapons worth billions of dollars that boosted uh, Israel's uh, economy. 
that's why it's important to compare always uh, between the South African defunct apartheid regime uh, and the Zionist regime in uh, uh, in Palestine. The Israelis consider uh, any normalization with any country around the world to be uh, a, 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 an important step in legitimizing that racism uh, that characterize uh, their regime. Are we going to encourage that? Or should we discourage that? Following your writings, the articles you have written throughout the years and books and so on, you seem to me as someone who's a bit more creative. Um, is there a third option between fighting Israel and normalizing Israel? Is there any third option? Well, there is only one option, really, which is justice and occupation. That's all. Israel is occupying illegally Palestinian lands. And this is according to UN Security Council uh, resolutions, according to international law. Israel is dispossessing the Palestinians on a daily basis. They need to stop these crimes against humanity. It's very simple. Um, and uh, of course, this doesn't have to uh, happen uh, in one go. It can happen in stages. And that's, that's where the, issue, the uh, question of Hudna Uh, came in in uh, at the time when Hamas won the elections in 2006. But of course now what the Israelis are doing are not leaving room for any talk about Hudna or about uh, uh, peace initiatives because they, are, they, they seem to be intent on depopulating the entire Gaza Strip. Normalization is seen by many as something that's wrong and as betrayal. But seeing it from a, let's say, Islamic paradigm, Is there any contradictions in it? Because I thought about it when I heard Bolson say, think about it um, not ideologically. So if we actually think about it ideologically, is there any contradiction between normalizing and representing a, a Muslim or Islamist paradigm? Well, the question has nothing to do with ideology. It's to do with the quest for justice. I mean, why why people find it easy to forget about these absolute values? You, I mean, take my mother's case. My mother was 16 years old when her parents, herself and her siblings, were forced out of their home in Beersheba. And they went to Hebron, to my, ma- my father's hometown. To my mother, the only thing that could have uh, brought an end to this conflict is to return to her home, the home in which she was born, the home in which she uh, was raised. And this is the same thing that applies to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions now of refugees and the descendants of the refugees. These people have rights. This is nothing to do with ideology. It's to do with justice. Let the Israelis acknowledge that their project was wrong, that Zionism is wrong because it's an ideology based on racism. And then we can talk about how Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live peacefully and can coexist in that part of the world. But until this apartheid regime is over, it's useless to talk about about anything. You cannot talk about it because they don't see you as equal human being. So what's the point of talking to them? If we go back to Gaza for a moment, it's been a month exactly since Hamas attack. As someone who have written and studied Hamas in depth, when do you think Hamas would interpret the development as a victory? And when would they interpret it as a defeat? It's not Hamas that's going to interpret this. It's observers. It's mm. uh, probably the next generation. But let me tell you something that happened on the 7th of October. Immediately after the world was shaken by that attack on the 7th of October, uh, several uh, American commentators wrote... Uh, comparing what happened on the 7th of October 2023 with what happened in Vietnam in 1968 in what is known as the Tet Offensive. Mm. The Tet Offensive lasted from February until August 1968. And it took the Americans and the world by surprise. The Vietnamese, the Northern Vietnamese and the Viet Cong who were allied against the Americans in South Vietnam managed to conquer two-thirds of South Vietnam. Eventually, they were defeated. The Americans, after sustaining so many losses, managed uh, eventually to push them back. But these commentators said one thing, that the Tet Offensive changed the course of history. Because that was the moment the Americans realized 
that their presence in that part of the world was no longer possible. That public opinion in America changed from that moment onwards. That civil rights, the civil rights movement, that anti-Vietnam, uh, anti-war uh, in Vietnam uh, movements picked up and the Americans were forced to reconsider. They entered into negotiations with the Viet Cong for several years, and then eventually they withdrew unilaterally uh, in uh, humiliation that is documented in footage. Mm. These commentators said that the 7th of October might change the course of history for Israel. I see it this way. There's so much damage to Gaza, there's so many killing, this genocide is being perpetrated. It's very painful. It breaks our hearts. But long term, I think what Hamas did on the 7th of October will change the course of history. It is marking the end of Zionism. The end of Zionism, not just as a state occupying Palestine, but Zionism as an ideology that is supported across the world by people who have been fed misinformation, disinformation, propaganda in order to side by the aggressors against the victims. Are you then saying that uh, Hamas, they're not looking at the short-term result of what's happening right now? They're waiting to see what the long-term outcome would be? I think probably uh, Hamas did not expect the sort of reaction that is happening now in the world uh, following the attack on the 7th of October. Uh, the reaction by Israel or the world? By the world, by the world as a whole. By Israel, probably they expected uh, a fierce uh, reaction. Hmm. But... I think uh, they were probably planning something smaller. It grew big. Uh, the failure of Israeli intelligence, the failure of Israeli um, means of reconnaissance, of uh, monitoring, of protecting those settlements uh, around uh, Gaza, uh, it, it augmented the impact of that uh, uh, of that event of that attack. Uh, Now, you see, it doesn't matter what Hamas thinks now. What really matters is what the Palestinians think, what mm. the supporters of Palestine think in the region, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, but around the world as well. I think that many eyes have been opened. I think many people are rethinking their positions vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in Palestine. They're seeing Israel for what it is. as we've been seeing it as Palestinians, a racist colonial uh, outpost uh, that is making life impossible, not just for the Palestinians, but for the people they brought from around the world to create together the state of Israel. Some people see Hamas as, uh, as an organization that in its roots are uh, anti-Semitic, some would say, even a world-renowned uh, journalist and commentator as Piers Morgan, he says in a question he asked one of his guests last week uh, something that relates to it. Let's try have a listen and uh, we can comment then after. The Israel effectively controls Gaza. It doesn't do so politically, but it does in reality. And that for many young people in Gaza, they know this and they do feel that they've been living in a perpetual prison camp where their movement is controlled, where their access to basic things like water and energy and so on is controlled, uh, and that in, until they get the freedom that they crave, this can never get resolved. Well, But I also you know, understand on the other side that the Israelis feel, how can we give freedom to a place that is run by a terror group who are literally committed to the eradication of not only Israel, but all Jewish people? What do you make of that claim that Hamas is, quote, committed to eradicate of not only Israel, but all Jewish people? That's ridiculous, of course. I don't know who the speaker is, but I think he's either uh, utterly ignorant about Hamas and about the history of the conflict, or he is just trying to mislead uh, the audience listening to him. Uh, an Arab or a Muslim cannot be accused of anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is something European, is some, something characteristic of Christian, of Christian Europe. It's to do with the Christians accusing uh, the Jews of killing Jesus Christ. It's to do with European racism against the Jews. That's why we had the pogroms in Russia. We had all sorts of persecutions. And then we had the Holocaust. Whereas in the Muslim world, 
the, the, the Jews, as I mentioned earlier, lived peacefully and uh, contributed to the Islamic civilization for centuries. Now, to accuse Hamas of being responsible for the prison in which the people of Gaza is just ludicrous. It, who is who is imprisoning who? It's Israel who is imposing a siege on uh, Gaza. It's Israel now who is imposing siege on the West Bank. Mm. Now, who is controlling when the people of Gaza can have water or not, when they can have electricity or not, when they can have milk or not? Piers Morgan is not the only commentator who uh, alludes to that Hamas uh, wants to eradicate all Jews, and sometimes they point to the Hamas charters from uh, 88 and so on. Isn't it something that, I mean, you would most likely have studied these charters? Is there, isn't there anything in them that you would consider as anti-Jewish? Of course, the, I, I discussed the charter in my book. I have an entire chapter on it. I criticize it and I advised Hamas to uh, cancel it and come up with a different charter. And uh, it is regrettable that that charter has been identified with Hamas, contrary to the so many statements that are made by the Hamas people. Uh, that charter was written in the summer or was published in the summer of 1988 mm -hmm. when the majority of Hamas top leadership were imprisoned by the Israelis. It was written by one man. It was published and released. And it is uh, it relies heavily on Jewish conspiracy in explaining or in trying to explain uh, the conflict. And I criticize that uh, strongly. Uh, I regret to say that Arab and Islamic literature, like Christian literature before, was infiltrated by this fake document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, mm. uh, which uh, claims that there is uh, some sort of a global Jewish conspiracy against the world. It's all ridiculous and cannot be accepted. Uh, Uh, to uh, keep referring to that charter in order to explain Hamas uh, positions uh, is ingenuine, it's uh, unethical. Uh, Hamas' real position is to be taken from its official spokespersons, and they do make a distinction between the Jews and the Zionists. The Zionists are invaders and occupiers. Mm. The Jews who follow Judaism are most welcome to live anywhere in the Arab world. And Hamas are not the only ones who's trying for the last many years to make that distinction between Zionists and Jews. A lot of people, commentators, debaters, and so on, opinionists have tried to make that distinction very clear. Um, but there are still some people in Israel who's on the left wing who consider them th themselves as, one could say, peaceful Zionists. And they might see, th see anti-Zionism as anti-Semitic. No, of course not. Uh, uh, anti-Semitic is anti-Jewish. Anti-Zionist is against an ideology that has something to do with um, a group of secular atheist Jews in Europe who thought that the solution to the, Jew to the Jewish problem in Europe would best be uh, achieved by having a state for the Jews uh, themselves. And this is something that was opposed by the majority of the Jews at the turn of the 20th century. The overwhelming majority of Jews were opposed to Zionism. Um, I, I'm glad to see a phenomenon in Israel. Uh, first, part of it, uh, that phenomenon is a migration from Zionism to anti-Zionism. There are an increasing number of Israelis, of Jews in Israel, who open their eyes to the reality. And they, now, now they see that Zionism is not good news for them. Mm. Uh, also, the left in Israel actually is dying. It's it's almost expired. I mean, the the the, the founding fathers of Israel were leftists. They were even at times associated with communism because of the kibbutz movement, etc. But now the people who control Israel and who rule Israel today and who are who are perpetrating the genocide in Gaza uh, are a, a new breed of Zionists called religious Zionists. Mm. It's a contradiction in terms, by the way, because when you, cannot, when you mix uh, Zionism, which is originally an atheist secular ideology, with religious Judaism, you get this explosive cocktail. Mm. Dr. Azam, let me just, uh, to make time, I wanted to play um, a soundbite for you, elaborating on the Zionist identity. We have the US President Joe Biden, who, uh, who said this. Were I a Jew, I would be a Zionist. And my father pointed out to me, I did not need to be a Jew to be a Zionist, for I am. Joe Biden is a Roman Catholic, but he calls himself a Zionist. 
Uh-huh. Well, there are Muslim Zionists today as well. So Zionism is not something uh, peculiar uh, to, or exclusive to, to some Jews. There are many Jews who are anti-Zionist, opposed to Zionism, whether they are Orthodox Jews or secular Jews. But there are Arabs and Muslims who are Zionists, people who are colluding with Israel today in the genocide. Is that a modern phenomenon? Zionists. Or is it uh, something that's coming from the roots of Zionism? It's, it's, it's a growing phenomenon, but it has existed since the turn of the century, since uh, some people colluded with the Balfour Declaration uh, and uh, uh, helped pave the way for the creation of Israel. And which kind, which people was that, uh, if you could elaborate on it? Well, many of the uh, ruling elites uh, Uh, who collaborated with the British uh, during the British mandate uh, were were willing to give away Palestine to the uh, uh, Zionists in exchange for uh, serving their own self-interests. And that's people from the Arab Muslim world. Yes, yes. Last question, in uh, if you just in one minute could answer this question about in twofold, what do you foresee being the most likely outcome of this entire situation for the people of Gaza and the rest of the world? Well, the, unknown, the, the, the future is something that we, we can never uh, decisively predict. But I think Israel is very likely to lose again as it lost in previous uh, similar uh, attacks. And no matter what happens to the people of Gaza or to this current conflict, this issue will continue to be living. And I think from now on, it will have a lot more sympathizers and supporters around the world than it ever did. Dr. Azam Thamimi, thank you very much for being with us on the program. Thank you. And thank you for listening to this very important conversation. My name has been Ilyas Ramadan. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.